it's really good to be here tonight and to share with um, with anyone who's really willing to listen, you know, tips on digital hygiene and how to really protect themselves in the digital space. I think it's um, especially after the leak that just happened with social security numbers. Um, you know, I just covered that today in my morning radio show. Um, I think we've had a breach with a data broker and that data broker basically lost about 2.9 billion files and that included social security numbers and everything on every American. So tonight when you're watching this, I want everyone to realize I'm not just speaking to scare you because I don't like to do that. I think, you know, you always have to always show hope, but what we're going to discuss are items that most of us just take for granted and we think we're protected if we have a password, but the truth is we're not. Um, we have to worry about data breaches today, malware. You have to worry about social engineering. There's so many areas today where you have to protect yourself that it's no longer just a teeny topic. It's actually a much more complicated topic with many layers. So I'm grateful to have this platform that I share with you from time to time to explain this. But the most important part of what I'm trying to explain is not to scare, but to get people to do certain actions that will massively protect them in the future. And I think this is super important and, and too easy to take this for granted until you have a data breach as large as the one that just happened. Then you take that data breach and you apply it to people's lives and how many people will be wasting time trying to either get back their identities or actually having been affected by the data breach being victims of it that's sad to me i think we need to help people not be victims absolutely i think we're also very desensitized to the risks in our online world so in your opinion what's one of the biggest misconceptions about digital safety and why could it be harmful well right now digital safety is more than just one thing. If you wanna be digitally safe, you're gonna have layers. And those layers will actually be what protects you. So for me, for example, um, I would, well, first of all, we'll just talk about the big, you know, the, the big issue. Most people do not have a unique password on all of their accounts. They usually share passwords and multiple accounts have the same passwords. Now. That's great. And it's easy for the end user to remember that, you know, but if you get breached and you only have one password and one, you know, um, one unique um, setup for what your life is, then it can all be taken down with just your few, few set of passwords or whatever you're using. So one thing I advocate for is you should have every account should have a unique password. That way, if you get breached in one account, the perpetrator has no way to get into anything else. And it stops at the one account. And that is the first thing that I ask people to do is change all of their passwords. It's very funny. The day I was on the air and the main DJ um, Bull, Bulldog just basically said, you know, well, I have like 129 different passwords that I have to remember. And that's a big toll order to change all of them to different passwords. And my suggestion to him was though, but if you get breached on any one of these, the amount of time you'll spend trying to get your data back will be is much more than if you just take the time to go down and change 129 passwords. So I would say to everyone, you're going to either deal with this on the end of a cyber attack, or you would deal with it um, by you just having proper digital hygiene, and it starts with passwords being all unique. Can't hear you. Oh, I was muted. So I absolutely agree with that. You talk a lot about layered solutions where there's not one foolproof solution or this magic tech solution to all our problems. When we're talking about protecting children on the internet, especially with that aspect of things, I couldn't agree with you more. So there are, again, are a lot of misconceptions about something solving a problem or being the all, end all be all of online safety. So in your opinion, talk, can you tell us a little bit more about some of these 
security measures that are being proposed right now and whether or not you see them as an effective solution or what the effective solutions you see are when it comes to digital safety? Well, if I had children today, um, three things I would immediately do is, first of all, is I would have a dialogue with the children and be very involved in their digital world, meaning I would know every app, everything that is on their phones or in their iPads that you give them. And when you give them any pad, including Androids, what's important is you get involved in their activities. You understand the activities. You go into the same chat forums they go into. Take a look at their posts. And if you, things, if you see things you don't like, don't immediately start um, fussing at them or yelling. Instead, what I suggest is start to seek understanding and give them a time for self-correction, correct them back into good behavior. The reason this is important is children today have the world at their fingertips, so they can always find an opposing view to yours. And that's what they're going to rely on to justify whatever they're doing against your will. So what you don't want to have is a battle of will. What you actually want to have is a dialogue with them. You want them to be involved. And what I try to say to parents that ask me this is, Become their accountability partner, but have them also look at your phone. Now, this is where it gets really tricky mm -hmm. and parents usually look at you and go, no way. This is the deal. The truth is, if you're willing to be accountable to your children, that will increase the actual probability that they're going to be accountable back. So I really recommend this first technique. And I know this is the one that is not technologically bound. Second one is... I would definitely put an app on the phone to actually monitor all the children's activities. And Kim, you know some of those, those apps, and I'm going to let you name some of them because it's something you've actually been working with. But those apps are great, but the problem is we know some kids are very um, tech savvy and will jump over them by going either to a friend's house or using a VPN or other forms of... of um, by extension, they just figure out ways around these um, apps that try to lock the kid down into a playground that you set up for them. Well, the problem is, is that you might lock the playground down, but understand when your child goes to school, he gets access to people's phones that are not broke or that are not locked down and might get right back on and do everything that you don't want them to do. That is why I always advocate that it's a layered approach because you also want to have a relationship with your children. You want to see what they're actually looking at as much as you have an app on there to put them into your, your world, your worldview too, all the apps you approve. And then finally, the third one, and this is a super important side to this, which is all everyone in the family has to in my opinion, have an occasional technology day where everyone talks about um, digital hygiene. For example, email fifing. That is when someone attacks you, trying to send you an email or a text, you can be text fifing, and where basically texts are sent and they're trying to solicit you to give up personal information. And it will usually be like your water bills unpaid, your your internet bills not paid, Wells Fargo you owe money to, or something just weird. But the bottom line is, so many people fall for these attempts in texts, and kids can fall for them too. And before you know it, you're entering information you shouldn't be entering, and these are really bad actors. And once they get that information, they use it against you. So. It's super important that you never just plunge in on emails or on texts and give private information out. I always recommend that you call the companies and make sure that it's legitimate what you're doing, but be very careful. Don't rely on texts and emails any longer to be truly factual. The way they hack the email systems can look so legitimate and it's very easy to fall for it. So I say, check with the company by phone first before you do anything. Kim, what do you think of that? I agree. I know someone who recently had their bank accounts wiped because of a similar type of hack. But like you said, it's less of a technological gap and more of 
us being hasty, having busy lives, and not necessarily taking notice of ways that we're being taken advantage of. So I love your balanced approach, as always, where you have this extensive knowledge of technology and you're very realistic about the risks and the solutions. But there's also so much that's required of us as humans and we can't take ourselves out of the equation, whether it's parents protecting children, whether we're relying on parental control apps, which we do recommend that parents use. However, it's not a replacement for parenting or for oversight or for communication and prevention. So some of those apps that we recommend, based on our research, we found that SpyX and Bark have some of the most comprehensive safeguards for parents that are monitoring their children's devices we have links and more information to them on our website. But again, we want to urge parents and caretakers and anybody who has children in their lives that it does take all of us to really be there physically, to be present with our children and to be involved, like Mark Straw said, to really know their digital world and be involved in it. Absolutely. There's no substitute to getting involved. I, you know, I, I just wrote a book, Kill a Tech and the Drive to Save Humanity, and it's available everywhere. It's really cool that in the book, I cited examples of what happened with my family and what happened to other people. And to realize that today you have um, Zuckerberg actually getting up and, and admitting, for example, that he was pressured to actually censor people and also he got up formally to actually apologize to parents. Now I understand these things were done under duress, but what's important is we're starting to wake up to a reality that big tech and all of us have a responsibility. It's not just us and it's not just the parents, but it's also big tech, it's also the world, it's all of us. And one of the areas that we're just a little shy on and I'm sad about about this because we have now politically deadlocked ourselves as a country to where we no longer can have these really important conversations to protect our kids because unfortunately as soon as you get into some of the topics it becomes very political so what i want to do is stop this dead in its tracks we're not going to do politics we are going to do solutions we are going to talk to people and we want people to talk to us back, educate us, explain how and what we can do to protect not just our children, but all of us. And one thing is important is that I'm an immigrant to the United States. I was born in England, grew up in Switzerland and then transferred to high school here. That's why I have very little accent. But because of my strange and extraordinary circumstances, which is in the book, and you guys can look me up and find that out, but in those extraordinary circumstances, I literally got to see the world. And we're so lucky to live in this incredible country. It, I, I hope that we can start to have dialogue with each other and actually start solving these issues. So when we talk about a multi-layered approach, I'm also talking about everyone I'm speaking to tonight, all of you guys, you're all the approach. You are the solution. Because if each and everyone listening to us would just go to their local um, schools, the ISDs, and find out what are they doing to protect children, and then you move up to the local town and the mayor and and town meetings and then you move up the ladder to state meetings and then you move eventually one day to the federal level the thing is if you want to change your community and protect your children you have to do it at a local level you have to do it super local then you move out and out and out and out and you can do a lot and actually it's very interesting because activism today has become basically the norm. People love to be activists and actually mm -hmm. activate. But the truth is, we're not doing it in harmony to actually make results occur. I think it's really interesting, but if we really look at our activism, 
we're actually hitting each other over the heads with, with two by fours. We're not actually solving problems. That's because we're not talking to each other. We're just going whack. Mm. Completely agree.